Hey guys, uh, thanks for having me. It's a real treat to be here. Let's see if I can control this slideshow. It's, uh, it's me. He's going to do all the talking today, so I'll just go. <laughs> um, so I might have seen a few of you at the workshop uh, yesterday. I held a workshop with John Alsop, and uh, we talked about CSS3 animation, and then I talked a lot about animation principles. So hello again to you guys. Um, so just to get a good measure of the group here, in the workshop yesterday, it was a lot of engineers and a couple of designers. So how many uh, engineers do we have here? How many developers do we have here? OK, cool. And uh, designers? Any animators? Cool. And how about uh, those weird unicorns that can sort of do everything? All right. Uh, cool. So this is a talk for everyone. Uh, Designers, animators, developers, unicorns, dragons, sea slugs, whatever the hell you are. Um, so I'm going to be showing you how I take interfaces that sort of look and feel like this, which is and, and make them feel more like, like this, which is pretty cool, huh? It's, like, it's kind of like taking something that, that kind of looks like this and making it feel more like, like this. Um, and I'm going to show you how I do that uh, by going over a few things. I'm going to talk about the mechanics of animation, uh, a concept I like to call transitional interfaces, um, which is really making interfaces make more sense by leveraging animation, by leveraging the dimension of time. Um, I'm going to go into some web and native uh, examples of uh, bad execution of animation uh, in interfaces, some good execution. And uh, I'll touch on animation principles a little bit. Um, so I prepared a few slides, which I'd like to go through now. So it's, a, it's two slides there, actually. Um, there's another one. So I want you to focus more on the slide here. That dog's an unnecessary design element. Um, and this is actually me, age two, using slides. So I've been around slides for quite a number of years. <laughs> I'm, I'm 84 years old, so uh, you do the math. There's me again. There's a, there's, there's a point to this. Sort of hands, hands free. It's a pretty advanced uh, technique. And uh, fast forward to, to me at age 13. I look like I'm about seven or eight years old here. Uh, but I assure you, I'm about 13 years old. And uh, I'm sitting at an animation desk. And the guy next to me, his name's Peter McDonald. And he was my animation mentor, really. I met him at a, a film festival a good number of years ago. And uh, he's a Disney animator. At this time, I was messing with the web a lot and drawing a lot of pictures with the computer. I was really fascinated with animation. But I didn't really understand a whole lot of the principles. So when I met him and I showed him the work that I was doing, he was fascinated. He was one of those old buggers that had never really touched a computer before. So we started working together. And uh, he taught me a lot about animation principles. And I taught him all I knew about computers and how to take his drawings, how to take those and ink them, and how to composite them and sequence them. And, and we ended up working together. We worked on a lot of commercials together. And then eventually, I started working on my own commercials. Oop. So it was mostly 2D work, and I was working with a lot of internet brands and agencies in Australia and Canada and the United States, which is pretty fun. And then uh, I joined this company called Johnny Cupcakes in Massachusetts, it's in, uh, in Boston. And I got to work on a lot of really weird things there. I got to design toys, um, and I was away from web and software for quite a while. Um, and I even got to produce this really weird animated commercial for the opening of the London store. And it was something that you normally wouldn't get to do at a clothing label. It's a pretty weird thing to get to do. And it was a ton of fun. But I really missed working with technology. I missed all the cool shit all my friends were making in, uh, in San Francisco. So then I moved to San Francisco. And I started working at a games company called Mind Snacks. And when I joined, it was a very, very small team. It was just the founders. It was uh, a couple of engineers and um, the, the guys that founded the company. There were a bunch of co-founders. And uh, I joined as the creative director there, where I developed the aesthetic and the animation style of all of the games. 
And uh, I really wanted to make animation-driven interfaces, one that felt like a game, ones that felt intuitive and had some real character. And I got to explore a bunch. I used to go to the aquarium, I used to go to the zoo, and I'd observe uh, all the animals and weird critters there, and all the people watching the uh, animals, and all the people watching the people. It was, it was pretty weird. And I'd take a lot of that, and I would try to graph that over into the interfaces and the games and, and the, the essence of what I was building. I would take what I, what I observed away from the computer and put it into the computer. Um, and it was a ton of fun. While the company was, was really young, I got to explore a lot of experimental interfaces. But as companies grow, it becomes a lot harder to try really fun experimental things. And I wanted to do that more and more. So then I joined a new company called Elepath, uh, where I am now. And we make a lot of really, really cool tools and toys there. Um, and I explore that stuff every day. And I'll show you some of the stuff uh, that I've worked on there in a little bit. So there's a really specific type of language we animators use when we're talking about how and why things move. Engineers, they talk about like graphs and, and numbers and iterators and variables and all of that cool stuff. And we talk about cushioning and anticipation and spacing and timing and anvils and all this weird stuff. And it's a really hard thing to communicate animation ideas when we both speak in very different terms. So earlier this year, I wrote an article called Transitional Interfaces, and it was an internal article at Elepath. And we decided to share it as uh, an article on medium.com. And I scraped the surface of animation principles, things like uh, easing and timing and spacing, the language of animation. And it was somewhat of a crash course for designers and engineers. And I also included some visual examples to take it from theory into practice, and I covered some really specific ideas, like drilling in the list views and removing and inserting data into a view and solving things using animation. So this article was something I produced so I could collect an essence of what I care about and communicate it to the other employees, to communicate animation ideas to the employees, because I'd never worked with animators before. And as a primer on animation, it was, it was successful. I started seeing the Elepath guys uh, work more animation into their prototypes. Instead of asking questions about color and, and, and shape and form and is this thing glitchy or not, uh, I started getting questions like, how fast should this thing move? Does this overshoot look right? How about the easing on this? Is the exponential ease the right thing to use here? Or here's an animation prototype I made. What do you think? Could you help me tune this thing? So after I put my article on Medium, it made the rounds, and so much so that I was asked to come speak here today. So again, thanks for having me here. Um, so I want to expand on the ideas in my article, which I recommend reading after this talk if you haven't read it already. And I want to introduce some more specific things that I couldn't quite communicate on, on paper or, or on the web or in, in an article. So I hear an argument from a lot of people, it's, it's sort of an excuse against the general use of animation in interfaces. And there's an argument saying that animation takes up valuable time to implement when you're building the product. Well, no shit, animation is really freaking hard. Of course, it takes longer to do something well, but it has a huge impact. Another argument I hear is that animation takes time out of a user's day to have to observe, observe the animation. Sort of true. But it can also take time for the brain to register an abrupt change in an interface. And that's a problem that a lot of people against arguing animation are, I don't think they're quite getting. They're probably ex exposed to some pretty shitty animation, to be honest. Good animation is invisible. You shouldn't notice that you're looking at animation in most cases. It makes way more sense to spend a small amount of time visually describing the space of an interface rather than leaving a user confused by a sudden change. Too much change in a user interface can leave a user disoriented, and that really takes time to recover from. An animation is a clue. It can explain why information is flowing around and how it's connected Animation is about designing with the dimension of time, the fourth dimension. It's, it's not some novelty. It's something that we can leverage. We think about how big or small or how short or long or how bright or dark something is when we think about 
design, but why not think about how long something takes or how the position of an object lines up with time or how the, sign, how the sizes line up to an alignment of something else that's relative to time. We've been building software with such an old mentality of screen after screen after screen after screen after screen, just sort of clicking into each other. And it's jarring, it's confusing. And I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you what that looks like. And it's pretty weird that it's the baseline. Human software should feel as responsive as the humans that are using it. We're not computers that take arbitrary inputs and signals and just parse them right away like robots. We observe and react and we respond to things. We watch and we observe change. We emote and we have feelings about stuff. We're sensitive creatures and we're, we're, we're lumps of organs and we're flesh and we're cells and we're bacteria. We're organic. We're made of meat. We're not a bunch of wires that are talking to other components with, with ones and zeros. So here's a little extract from a 1993 Stanford paper that my good friend Jack Rusher dug up pretty recently. It's called From Cartoons to the User Interface. User interfaces are often based on static displays, a series of displays each showing a new state of the system. And typically, there is much design that goes into the details, but less thought is given to the transitions between them. Visual changes in the user interface are sudden and often unexpected. Cartoons, in contrast, excel at providing enough information for the audience to follow the action without ever being startled and confused by puzzling behavior. Cartoon objects do not flash suddenly into different sizes and shapes. They appear to grow and deform smoothly. Animation provides the visual clues necessary to understand what's happening before, during, and after the action. Unlike user interfaces, which burden the user with the responsibility of relying on experience and deductive ability to interpret changes, that's a bit of a mouthful, uh, cartoon animation leverages off human experiences of how objects change and move smoothly in the real world. <laughs> that's a great little spot by Nathan Lane for the NBC. So as you can see, an article that was written 20 years ago proves that this thinking isn't new, yet it's only in recent times have we seen people paying more attention to animation. And maybe perhaps the technology needed to catch up, but there's still, much, there's still so much to do with learning about animation and applying it to interfaces. But we don't need to rediscover the principles of animation that have been torn apart and leveraged for centuries. In fact, animation used to be created as far back as 180 AD. There were things like zoetropes and thaumatropes and praxinoscopes and mutoscopes and a bunch of other scopes, um, all things to explore the idea of moving pictures. Animation in ancient times used to be created mechanically and off the screen. So let's look at some mechanics of how animation works. There's a demo. I wanted to use that Steve Jobs brush font. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> so what I'm going to show you is my modified version of a thaumatrope. And it was a really popular toy in Victorian times. What it was was a, a disc, and you had a picture on each side with two pieces of string, and you'd wind the thing up, and, and you'd pull it, and it'd go, Boop, and you'd, you'd get this really interesting effect, which I'll show you now. So it's a fancy name, but it's, it's pretty low tech. So it's a pretty classic example. You may have seen it as a kid or on TV or in a, in a science fair. And it's a picture of a bird and a picture of a, a cage, two completely separate elements. So let's try alternating between the two pictures, the picture of the bird, the picture of the cage, with no effects, just alternating. So this is about two frames a second, and it just looks like two images abruptly changing. But what happens when we increase the frame rate? Well, you might get a seizure, but hold on. Uh, we start to blend the information together. Our brain wants to blend the signals together because it's just easier to understand because we're being pummeled with all of this information. So when we see two interface screens instantaneously swapping states, we want to process the difference. And it doesn't make sense. Imagine launching an app like Instagram 
from your iPhone and just seeing it snap into place like this. We're not seeing fluid movement. We sort of get this weird merge conflict in our brain for a moment, and it feels off. The two pieces of information can't blend together. So look at that transition versus how it flows between states with animation. Makes a lot more sense. There's not really anything in real life that instantaneously turns on or off, changes states like that. In fact, most of the ones we think look instant take time to change. For example, a light bulb turning on and off. Looks instantaneous, but it's not. Or a balloon popping, or a really big balloon popping. I wonder if we're getting audio or not. There should be some audio in here. I guess not. It sounds cool. <laughs> Is that cool, like, slow motion, like, <laughs> I'll do the sound effects if you want. <laughs> oh, there you go. Thank you, Mr. Sound Man. So it's definitely not instantaneous. <laughs> I want to know where you're going to balloon that big. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> getting back to it. Why do we see interfaces that lack motion? Why is this normal? Why is it the standard? Let's look at an example I prepared. So here's a hot new service called Blumbler. It was purchased by Blahu for like $100, but I was lucky enough to get some design assets before they shut the thing down. Marissa. Uh, so... <laughs> Here's a run-of-the-mill feed with updates, right? So it's really intuitive. We're just going to hit the new post button. And we get this popover form with the light box thing. So we stay on the same page. That's cool. And let's type an update. And then let's, uh, let's click the post button. Cool. So we're taking back to the stream. Don't worry. This is a real-time app. It'll live refresh in a second. And there we go. So what just, what just happened there? Let's, let's flick back and forth for a second. So all the posts m move down as the new entry enters, enters the, the stream. But you really have to concentrate to notice that the elements are being displaced. It's really jarring. So why don't we just try softening it out with a little animation? All right, well, here's the Blumbler homepage again. Beautiful, beautiful design. Try to ignore how beautiful it is. And let's go through the flow and break down each movement. So we click the new post button, and what we get is, is the popover. And that's, that's really abrupt, right? So let's look at the new elements that are being introduced here. So there are two key components. There's, there's a light box, the sort of dimmer, and then the post form itself, which is being introduced. So how can we introduce them with animation? Well, the fade element here, this light box has transparency. So we can take advantage of that attribute and we can animate that change over time. So we'll animate the box in. Now that's nothing fancy, but it's a hell of a lot better. And now we just need to get that form element in there. So let's just slide it in with a, with a cushion in. Or the more familiar term might be in ease in. Cool. So we don't need to see it all happen step by step. We don't need to see each element be introduced in this, in this chain. That would take way too long. We can have overlapping action, which is where you can have multiple things happen at the same time with a, maybe a small amount of offset. You don't want to spend too much time slinging around transitions and making the user watch them. You just need enough to be able to soften an action or describe the space that you're in. So while we're at it, we'll add a little more overlapping action to the form to make it feel less rigid. So we'll sort of delay the text. And a little flare that sits inside the same timing can really help sell the motion. It can really help carry the eye. So we'll look at the flow now. So that feels much better. And let's finish it off using the idea of presenting and unpresenting elements. Um, so after this, we're going to need to remove the form 
And then we're going to need to show that Blumbler is thinking, which of course means the browser and the server are sending and receiving requests. But the user doesn't need to know that shit. They just need to know what, they don't, they just need to know that Blumbler's thinking. They don't need to know what's going on behind the scenes. Um, they just need to know that the thing sitting right in front of them, in front of their eyeballs, is doing the thinking and it received their request. So showing the reaction to an action helps the user feel like the application is responding. Animation can provide really important feedback in that context. And once we get rid of the form and, the, and, and we're ready to show the post, let's try to move everything down. Let's actually move the elements down and, and show the element come into place. So we'll look at that flow now. And there you go. So you could take it further. You could have the text inside the box be the same text that gets injected into the stream, and you can make that weird post box pop out of the new post button. But that might be a little too bold. Um, it can be overkill, and it's sometimes possible to soften out these harsh changes with just a small amount of animation, just a few frames. Um, so this interface feels smoother, and it's easier to see how the information enters and how it leaves it. And there are really endless possibilities to explore. That was just one approach to bringing the form element in. We could try adding a fade to the translation on the Y so it doesn't have to drag all the way up the page. We sort of start from the lower two thirds and get to the halfway point. So that's a good underestimated alternative. Or we could play with scale, a little overshoot instead of translating the position. And this one is, this one has a little more impact. It, it sort of feels like something's urgent and it's sort of like a, hey, sign up or post an update. It's, it's really getting into your face. So that's probably better suited to something like an alert or really important action. And on a similar thread, we could play with some perspective in 3D. And this is just some x-axis rotation with a little, uh, little Z translation. Or you could go fucking crazy and you could composite some effects using the canvas or whatever the hell you want to do. Um, but you definitely wouldn't use this for an element that you would see all the time. That'd be ridiculous. Maybe it's a congratulatory screen or something. It's entirely possible to abuse animation, and I've seen a lot of people do this. Um, you have hierarchy in traditional design, things like shape and color and weight and size and all of those things related to form. And you can think about this hierarchy in the same way with animation. Understated animation can be used to soften out rough spots, and embellished animation can be used to reward a user. Sometimes you might want a user to notice a beautiful piece of animation, but most times you don't. It's a balance, and if you use too much, you could make your users motion sick. It's entirely possible. I used to work at a visual effects studio uh, doing a lot of 3D animation, and a bunch of the animators had to take medicine because they would get sick. They would puke from spinning around these interfaces all day. So it's a reality. So as I'm sure you all know, iOS 7 was a big change from iOS 6. <laughs> Shit got flatter. Some things turned ugly neon. But a lot of nice animation was added. Well, sort of. Things started to flow better. And it also seems to have inspired the web to adopt a lot of similar animation patterns iOS 7 has so much animation at its core. Things like flowing between screens in the Messages app, subtle changes in the timing of the keyboard sliding in and seeing the message be injected into the stream of other messages. Um, you know, there's like changes to Safari, which includes the address bar, which shrinks and gets out of the way, and it opens up to make room for input when it's needed. Uh, and the content fades in instead of just popping in after the search. There's the share sheet. I mean, that was an iOS 6 thing. But it, it feels like it's part of the bigger organism of animation now. And it's more than just this out-of-place flourish. And arguably, I think that the animations, the transitions for hopping between folders and apps drags on a little too long. They could slice that in half. Um, but there, in general, there are some pretty nice things. But it's funny. A lot of existing products now seem very rough when compared to interfaces that care about motion. So I'm going to be critical, and I'm going to show you some real examples, um, products that you've probably used before. So Twitter.com, I'm sure you've all heard of it. Um, so we're going to look at the web version here. So here's my timeline, and I'm going to show you what it looks like when you expand a tweet to see more information about it. 
So it's pretty simple. Just slides down and reveals a new information. Not too hard to do with a little JavaScript or jQuery. You could use the, what is it, the slide down function or something. Um, I don't know. I'm not, I am not an engineer. I'm sorry. Uh, but I love, I love engineers. Um, so that looks good. There's an awareness of animation there. Uh, so let's expand another tweet, this time with a photo attached to it. So what the fuck? <laughs> um, it's pretty rough. It, it's better the second time because the image is inside the DOM. But you can see the image pop in the first time. That's really sloppy. And you could solve this pretty easily. I mean, maybe a spinner. That's probably the laziest and easiest way to do it. Let's, let's have a look. You could show a spinner while the app's thinking and then perform the action of displaying the content. So we'll try the really quick fix. Much better. It just seems silly to me that attention has been put into something like expanding a tweet. So there's animation thinking there, but no thought was given to the content inside the tweet that's being presented. That seems ridiculous to me. Once you see something animate and you see it feel responsive, you want the rest of it to feel as fluid. You set up an expectation for everything else to feel that way. So how about expanding new tweets? Well, what the? That's, that's weird. It's sort of a slap to the eyeballs now. And they can at least fade it in. I did it with Blumbler. <laughs> and it's really not that hard, hard to fix. You just need a, a simple transition to introduce the elements, like a couple of milliseconds. Something like a fade in or a scale would do the trick. So enough poking at Twitter. We'll have a look at another site. So Facebook.com, the best website Jesse Eisenberg ever made. I love that, love that movie. So here it is, the news feed. Uh, the crown jewel of Facebook. We've got a bunch of apps on the left, a bunch of people I don't care about here. And uh, what else we got? We got some relevant ads on the side like... Uh, fries.com. Apparently, I'm a really big golf fan. Uh, but anyway, looks like my friend Joey Pfeiffer posted a funny video. He's usually pretty funny. So let's have a look at this video. So what happened there? That was really glitchy. I mean, obviously, there was a light box and there was a dark background there to help draw focus to the video. But it's presented so abruptly. Like everything pops in and glitches into the correct size as it's being drawn into the document. And it's a really frenzy mess. And you could just introduce the overlay and remove it with a few frames of animation and still let it feel responsive. Really not that hard to fix. So let's poke a little more. So I liked Joey's video. And I click like, and you get this, this, this little uh, thumb animation, which, which is cute. That's nice. So there's an awareness of animation there, but it's on something so freaking small. Like, uh, sure, it's attached to an important metric that they feed over to, what, the NSA or PRISM or, or whatever. Uh, <laughs> but it feels so out of place when the rest of the interface is so stiff. So, I mean, I hit like. And check this out, the freaking sidebar updates with data. It's like the server re received this like information and decided to throw more ads to me. <laughs> so that's stupid. So let's share Joey's hilarious roller coaster video because frankly, he needs it. He's trying to start his career in comedy, so sort of a big favor to him. I think this is being recorded, joeypfeiffer.com. Um, so we have this animated spinner and it sort of pops in. So it just feels broken. It feels really broken. And it, it's pretty clear to me that there isn't a complete disregard to animation at, at Facebook. Uh, for example, you can tell by the inconsistencies. Uh, here's me shamelessly plugging in an, an art print I designed, which you should buy. And, uh, you know, we were looking to see who, sh who shared it. So the, the, sh the sheet comes in pretty nice. There's some nice animation on it. So obviously this was worked on by a designer that cared about animation but the whole product organism, the whole thing, doesn't meet the standard. So it feels really weird. It sort of feels like a weird clown walked into a boardroom meeting or, or something. So it, it, even weirder is that animation is present at Facebook in, in some areas, but strangely, it's not consistent. I mean, there is the, uh, the smash hit Facebook home, which, which actually had some lovely animation. There was a nice fluidity to the interface. 
There were those weird chat head uh, things that you would drag around. And the transitions were soft. Girls, makes girls laugh. Girls love animation. Uh, <laughs> so nice spring dynamic physics across the interface. And, uh, sorry, one second. That was so awkward. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, Evernote for, uh, for iOS. So it's the ultimate kitchen sink app. I actually use this one a lot. It's useful, but with maybe 3 million too many extra features. And this was pretty uh, visible in the older version. In iOS 6, everything was made of wood and paper and cardboard and elephant skin, just like things, just like things are in real life. <laughs> uh, and Evernote recently did the big jump from iOS 6 to 7, and it adopted some cute little animation patterns at the same time. So iOS 7 version, it seems it's, like it's more about the content. It's very green. Um, and there's some nice new native elastic scrolling, which you get for free. There's nice overlapping action with the cells. And they sort of move independently from each other. So it's a nice adoption. That, that's good. And you add a new node, and it presents itself. It slides up, and that's great so far. But let's, let's go a little deeper. Let's look into drilling into a list. Let's go into a list item. So let's see what happens when we, uh, when we tap on uh, the right-facing arrow to look at my notebooks. My guess is that we would, we would slide over and, and have a look at the items that are, you know, further to this side. That's a typical view we see in, in, in mobile design patterns for animation. So this little thing over here. And we're going to tap it, and nope. <laughs> what is going on there? Like, why even have an arrow that points that way? It would make sense if they just removed the thing. It makes no sense. So the arrow's there, and it's labeling a direction in action that is completely wrong. So surely, up the top where it has my, has my name, uh, this profile link with an arrow facing downwards would be a drop-down arrow or slide all of the content down. So let's have a look. This little arrow here. Nope. Definitely not. So this minuscule little arrow here apparently points to a giant sheet on the opposite end of the interface that wants to thrust itself up into your face. <laughs> it's a joke. So it is really easy to be critical about things which are not ideal or, or shitty. Um, so let's look at some examples of well-crafted interfaces. So back to medium.com. There are some good chunks of animation here on the web. Like adding a comment, for example. Could probably use a little more aggressive easing, but it's really nice. There's a nice introduction of an element, and some nice animation when you're paging between articles. You get down to the footer, and the new article sort of pushes itself into place. And we have a, a little slide tray menu on the side. It's a pattern we're seeing all over the place, and it works really well. It's a good way to tuck away information. And the, uh, the stats pane here, it animates as you change periods of data, which is which is pretty cool. It's a nice touch. And then we have uh, Will Call, an iOS app for purchasing show tickets. So there's some good rhythm to the interface there. Uh, the way you drill down into a list item feels really responsive. The share sheets presentation and the highlighting of the Twitter and, and Facebook icons is a nice spring to it. It's a really good example of character in animation. There's some real personality to the animation in, in the interface. It's not very stock. And of course, there's Clear, the List app. And it's really obvious what's happening between state changes. Pinching and pulling around lets you add and remove items. And you see them enter, and you see them leave the screen. And there's a really established space. There's a really well-established viewport. And by setting up the app to feel like a viewport in the world, you can mentally sort of map the views to a real spatial dimension. You can hold that information in your head and understand where you are moving around the interface. And there are a bunch more of these that are, a bunch more apps that I think are doing, doing this really well, which I recommend checking out. There's like Letterpress by Lauren Brichter, Path, Dots by a fellow named Patrick Moberg, and uh, Tumblr. So I wanted to breeze through a couple of projects that I made at Allopath that were using the idea of transitional interfaces. Um, and a bunch of them were experiments which just never saw the light of day. 
So this was a weird thing I made called Debris, and it was this image chat toy. It's this never-ending stream of nonsense, and people could drag a picture in to the browser, they could snap one with their webcam, and uh, it was sort of like this weird hybrid of uh, the kind of crap you would see on Tumblr and 4chan, but in real time, it was, it was oh my gosh. Um, but this is just a simple animation here for revealing a, a button, and this was just a browse button. Um, this is a tiny little interface element that would, uh, that would hold the avatars of people that entered and left the room, and as they entered and left, uh, the, the, the container uh, expanded and, sh and shrunk to hold those avatars. And this was an isolated element, and it was created to show how a new image would be injected into the top of the stream, because it was this real-time real image feed. And it often helps to break out animation components and work on them in a sort of like sandboxed or quarantined environment so you can spend time really tweaking and designing the animation instead of seeing it in context with all the other design we can get and get really confusing. Other elements can sometimes be a distraction. And an interesting thing about debris was that as images had an expiry date, they sort of uh, deteriorated over time. So this was like a little, little prototype I built and we ended up using some interesting image processing stuff to reduce the block resolution of the images. Uh, this is a project that got put on the back burner. It was a little desktop tool called Wormhole, uh, which would let you beam files to your team or to other people really fast. And it was, a, it, was a, it was a Mac. It was a Mac app. So I motion prototyped this thing here. And you would grab a file, and you would throw it over the top of the menu bar. And uh, it would reveal this visor thing, and it would show you the recipients. And of course, I designed a lot of other states for errors and and sending to multiple people. Um, but the point of creating this animation pass was to be able to inspire an engineer to want to work on it with me, rather than showing them some really boring static comps, which aren't really enticing. I really wanted to make it clear what it felt like, what the story was like, to be able to take a file and throw it up the top, and, and they were like, oh, cool. So we still haven't built Wormhole, because we're we're kind of focusing a little more on uh, web, and, web and, and mobile apps. So if anyone here wants to build it, you should, you should just build it. Uh, and this, this, was a, this was a weird one. Um, <laughs> this was a, a, an app called Cramera. And instead of creating a bunch of motion comps, I went ahead and I animated a, a commercial in two weeks to sort of get an engineer on board to want to work on this project. So. It's got a bunch of scratch voices, which are all mine. I'll just run it now so you can, you can see it. Grandma. Grandma? No, no, no. It's Cramera. Huh? It's not Grandma. It's not Grandpa. Uh. It's not my mom. It's Cramera. Oh, OK. Well, what's Cramera? It's a really fast way to share a picture. First, you take a picture. Then you choose where to send it. And then what? It's hard to believe, but you're actually done. Crammer will send your picture along to Twitter, Tumblr, other things, and that's it. Crammer by Elephant. Available now. Wait, wait, this, this commercial's already over? So it was a little two-week commercial. We never released the thing, but it was pretty fun to just work on a, on a commercial. Um, so I've shown you a bunch of animation-driven interfaces. <laughs> But, but how, do you, how do you think about timing? How do we make animation feel more natural and familiar? Well, first of all, computers aren't, aren't on our side. Uh, we have to be very clear to computers about how to move things. We can't just tell them the in-between stuff for us. They don't understand the intent. Computers naturally want to fill in the gaps linearly because they're lazy metal plastic boxes of wires. And a great animator or motion designer spends a lot of their day fighting with computers so they don't mess it up. Computers are totally not out on our side. Like, remember this shit when the singularity happens. You've seen Terminator. So traditionally, we've designed interface states as static. We have state A and state B and state C. And then the lazy designer will just say, yeah, it just moves from state A to state B, dude. And like, we see a lot of really careless animation applied. It's all very linear. It's all the computer uh, in-betweening it for us. And most of the time, the motion just doesn't make any sense. Stuff just slides and flips around, and it's And it, it feels like some crappy default keynote animations like going between slides. And so, so many applications sort of feel like these weird glorified keynotes right now. So how do we remedy this? Well, we need to ask how. 
How does it transition between A and B? We gotta design that in-between state. So here's a waving arm. And there's two states. There's state A and there's state B, and they're, they're keyframes. Or more specifically in animation, we call them the extremes. And when planning animation, we look for the bounds to capture the generality of the performance, the extremes. And in the case of interfaces, it'd be like state A or state B. They would sort of be the extremes. They're the storytelling poses or drawings, and they're the ones with the most contrast and the most information. So once we have them, we need the frames in between to soften them out. And let's see what happens when we let the computer put the in-betweens for us using A and B as the reference points. So here we go. We're moving in an arc between A and B, but it's, it looks really stiff. And something looks really unnatural about this movement. I don't know if any of you wave this way, but it's not, it's not normal. Uh, so what's the reason? Well, it, it's linear timing still, first of all. It stops really hard and it changes direction instantaneously. There's no concept of slowing down and speeding up. There's no concept of acceleration and deceleration. It hits really hard as it changes and it doesn't feel natural. So how do we fix that? Well, if we let a computer interpolate the positions, we normally get linear spacing. So here's what linear spacing looks like. But look what happens when we move this middle position. This is the halfway position or the breakdown. If we move that position and bias it more towards A and B. So here it is closer to state B, and we've sort of adjusted the proportions of spacing so it gradually compresses. And here it is closer to state A. So the ratio, ratio of compression is what you, can, what you can derive if you start using an easing equation or a stock ease, like a sine ease or an exponential. And depending on the variables of the equation, you'll have a different type of fall off or a different type of easing. Um, and this is what they look like in motion. So on one side we have closer to A and on one side we have the breakdown closer to B. Or in animation terms we call it the ease out or the ease in. So I've applied some easing to the arm, and it's easing out and easing in. And uh, the soft cushioning feels organic. It still looks pretty stiff, right? So I've delayed some of the parts in this, this second example here. And uh, the arms are moving with some delay. It's really floppy, kind of like Woody from like, Toy Story. And by avoiding the effect of having objects arrive and depart at the same time, you really start to understand the weight and the form and the hierarchy of the object moving through space. So here's the same thinking applied to some abstract interface elements. So it could be a bunch of divs, list items, uh, whatever. And uh, they're moving in a linear fashion. They're, they're, they're stiff and they're lifeless. But often, this is about as far as, as we'll see animation uh, introduced. So here it is with some overlapping action. And they're the same elements, but with some crafted keyframes this time. The spacing is designed. The cells ease in and out, and they arrive and depart at different times with the overlapping action. And we see that the whole list is now made of these parts. It's not just one solid parent view that's being slid across an axis linearly. So, so much of designing animation is about the intent, how and why something gets from state A to state B. So how else can we think about the nitty gritty of getting from A to B? Where can we look for inspiration? Where can we learn from? Well, we can learn from the classics. I spent a good chunk of my childhood watching cartoons, and I'm sure most of you did. But I wasn't like a normal kid. I wouldn't watch cartoons just once. I'd watch them a few times, and then I'd sit down and watch them frame by frame, and it drove my parents insane. I'd watch movies, and some of them would take days to watch. <laughs> But I learned so much by studying the classical animation principles. And the most famous are the Disney 12 principles of animation, which are pretty commonly referred to by all animators in the industry. Things like anticipation, an anti-action or a wind-up to prepare for a bigger action. Cushioning or easing to make actions feel organic and natural. Squash and stretch, preserving volume and distorting form. <sighs> I 
an exaggeration for clarity. So that, of course, was from Roger Rabbit, one of the best animated films of all time, which I recommend watching. So, so many of the principles came from the research of animators studying the physics and the character characteristics of real life. And so many of the ideas which they stashed in their tool belts were derived from understanding the world and what was familiar. When I was lucky enough to find animator interviews and B-roll, I studied them very closely. And uh, I'm going to show you a little piece by uh, Disney animator and director Glenn Keane um, talking about uncovering inspiration for animating Tarzan. There's a whole evolution that an idea goes through from beginning to end. And you look at the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo didn't start by just immediately painting on the ceiling. He first had to do his studies before he could jump into it. The same with animation. Uh, we went to Africa, we studied how animals move, we studied sculptures, uh, anatomy. One of the things I loved about working in Paris was the chance to ride my bike and discover things along the way, like this statue by Dalou in the Place de la Nation. There's a man riding this lion, and when I went around this statue, I thought, that's Tarzan. So we started to do drawings based on what we saw from that sculpture and other studies of anatomy. We brought in the professor of anatomy from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. Uh, I did these drawings in pencil. He went over the muscles in red. We found that this costume that Tarzan was wearing was going to be the most complicated of all. It was the first time we'd ever animated actually a functioning human anatomy. One of the first exercises that we did was assigning for each animator to study an animal movement and transpose that into Tarzan. That's what we're going to take a look at here. So the very first test, these don't really look like Tarzan as much because this was our first attempt, but they were experimenting with how Tarzan would move as an animal. One, it's an animation here. This is not exactly on model Tarzan. It was his first attempt, but there was something nice about the way he clears his hair out of his eyes, I felt. Here, Christoph had been studying how monkeys clean off the bugs off of each other's hair and felt like, hey, why not have Tarzan do that? You know, to him, it's not unusual. Christoph, uh, in this scene, he was studying how basketball players hang on the hoop, and it was just a real fun uh, fluidity and natural rhythm to this movement. At the same time, with the animal feel that he's comfortable on all fours, and it, it just had this great freshness and spontaneity to his movement. So there are hours and hours worth of footage like that which you should trawl through on YouTube. Um, so really the point of my talk today was to spark the idea of animation thinking rather than specific methods to make animation. I did a workshop, like I said, with John yesterday. It was a full day workshop. and. Um, Putting all the animation curves down and nudging the keyframes is really a whole series worth of lectures. I mean, animators dedicate their lives to this stuff, but there's still a lot you can learn from what animators have done. Um, with that being said, you could be amazing at driving the software, and it doesn't matter which tool you use, whether it's Quartz Composer or Adobe Edge or After Effects or Flash or whatever. Um, but if you don't have the animation principles down and it doesn't move right, the interface is going to feel like shit. It'll feel goopy and it'll feel weightless, and that's a fact. So we've reached the end of my talk today, and it's been real fun. Um, the points that I would like to leave you with, the takeaways, uh, static interfaces suck. If you want to argue with me, I will argue with you, uh, and you won't win. Uh, Animation is a clue, and it's, it's meaningful. Animation can describe context. Um, great animation feels invisible. And there's a lot to learn from the classics. The principles apply to all forms of animation, and we don't need to reinvent the wheel. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>